Thanks, Dan. Um, actually, I uh, did want to slip in a few slides about the educational stuff, but it wasn't in the title, so you wouldn't have known that. Uh, and like Sam, I was going to focus on the uh, biology that we do and talk about all the stuff that's enabled by the things that JGI does, but not really talk much about that, that sequencing part of it. But I did want to just quickly, for a few minutes, make a plug for something that anyone who's interested in it can talk to me later about. <clears throat> We've had a project with my collaborator, Scott Woody, for years of trying to get genetics in the classroom. And plants are, a, in many ways, not all, but in many ways, a good organism for the classroom. Other possibilities are things like Drosophila, C. elegans, and so forth. But most teachers are pretty familiar with growing plants. It's easy to do. Uh, you can do things directly, like pollinate them. And we work on a rapid cycling member of the cabbage family, Brassica rapa, which is shown here. And you can see how small it is. This is someone's hand who's holding a little stick that they're doing uh, pollinations with. So it's a very small, rapid cycling plant. And just quickly, some of the things we're uh, doing and having sequence of this organism has enabled us to get to the genes involved in certain mutations. So I wanted to show you a sampling of the kind of mutants we're studying and developing for classroom use. <clears throat> but I do want to say, too, that there, uh, you can use plant genetics much more broadly than, than just to teach about plant development or biochemistry, for example. You could think about some of these mutants really like disease genes in animals or in humans. Um, we have mutants that are single gene metabolic defects. You can see the lighter color. They grow very slowly. Uh, some that can no longer measure light. They're blind, essentially. They lack uh, a gene for a major photoreceptor called phytochrome. So when you grow them in the light, these are the mutants here. Uh, they grow very tall and spindly as if they're grown in the dark because of that inability uh, to sense light. We have mutants that have defects in organs, for example, ones that do not form petals. And we're developing educational modules around these. The other thing, though, that the Brassica Rapid genomic tools that are uh, being developed at JGI will be very interesting uh, to apply to is domestication. That's something we're beginning to look at, but haven't, uh, haven't gotten very far. But the wild Brassica Rapa uh, looks something like this drawing. It's just a pretty uh, inconspicuous plant. But during dom domestication, uh, it has taken a lot of different forms, and I just have a few seed packages to illustrate that. So uh, various bok choys are brassica rapa, um, or uh, Chinese cabbage, or broccoli rab, which I hope you all noticed you had for lunch. It was in the, in the fried vegetable tray. And... Uh, Various uh, mizunas, or even uh, turnips, where a root uh, develops, uh, is and they're all brassica rapa. So they're, during domestication, there's been incredible uh, morphological variation, and it'll be very interesting to look at that as well. What I wanted to focus on, though, is as, as Dan said, our work on flowering, and I wanted to start with uh, noting that it is a um, biomass-related traits. So Sam gave a wonderful introduction to Brachypodium. Here's some uh, two different uh, gene, well, where'd that go? genotypes of Brachypodium. And I just wanted to let you watch them uh, grow. So the one on your left is one that flowers pretty rapidly. And at that point when it flowers, it's done growing. Whereas if you delay flowering, uh, what happens is you can get to this point. So Sam was, uh, or they'll, they'll just keep growing and form a lot of biomass. And uh, Sam was uh, mentioning how wonderful it is that, that Brachypodium is uh, so much smaller than switchgrass, but we're trying to turn it back into switchgrass, or at least understand how flowering can do that and, and create more biomass yield. But first I want to tell you about, and the aspect of flowering we're going to talk about in particular is how plants flower in response to going through winter, a process called vernalization. But I want to get back to uh, the cabbage family and talk a little bit first about our work in Arabidopsis and then why we want to also develop Brachypodium as a flowering model. So first, a definition. I think I sort of gave one. But vernalization is the acquisition of competence to flower after plants have been exposed to cold. And uh, domesticated cabbage is a good example of a plant with a very strong requirement for vernalization. Uh, breeders have really put this in strongly so that cabbage doesn't flower. Most of you probably haven't seen a cabbage plant flower. 
uh, because they will only flower if they're left in the field over the winter, in which case it's pretty spectacular when they flower in the next spring uh, because the plants, the flower stalk can be taller than, than I am. But anyway, that block to flowering is very important for cabbage as a crop. But I want to spend just a moment on uh, what's on talking about what in many plants is the adaptive value of this system of requiring cold to flower. <clears throat> and that is that in many species, uh, they're designed to flower very rapidly in the spring. And that's probably to avoid competition, to carve out a niche that's that's getting away from competition with other larger summer growing plants. So here's another member of the cabbage family, a, a common weed called shepherd's purse uh, that illustrates this. So this picture is of a plant almost done with its life cycle. The seeds are developing, it's almost done flowering. Uh, this picture was taken in Wisconsin in April several years ago and what you can notice is the tree that it's under, the leaves haven't even begun to release from the bud yet. So this plant's completing its life cycle when it's got a lot of moisture and before it's being shaded, for example, by larger plants. And these types of plants also grow, very, they're well adapted to growing in cool weather. So a key feature if you're going to establish that type of life history is to not only flower rapidly in the spring, but to make that possible to flower rapidly in the spring, the plants get established in the fall. And they typically start growing in the fall, again, after their larger competitors have started to shed their leaves and die back. And if you're going to get established in the fall, then it's important to have a way to not flower in the fall, to only let that occur uh, after winter. And so the real key about vernalization is it's a system that prevents flowering uh, in, in the fall season. And I want to tell you a little bit about how that works in a, another member of the cabbage family, Arabidopsis, and then say a few things about our studies in Brachypodium, uh, the grass, of how this is working. Uh, but I wanted to point out, too, by way of introduction, that such a system needs to measure a long period of cold. Uh, for plants that grow in temperate climates in the fall, there's often temperature fluctuation. So it might get warm in October, or I'm sorry, cold in October for a little bit, but warm again in, in November. And it's important that that little bit of cold doesn't trigger flowering, that flowering's truly prevented until it's actually spring. So if you look at this type of cold response, there are two major types of cold responses in plants. One's cold acclimation, where, uh, where plants are exposed to cold, there's almost immediate gene expression and biochemical changes that prepare the plant to survive cold. Uh, literally within minutes of cold exposure, there's changes in gene expression occurring. So very rapid responses, but a vernalization response, that acquisition of the ability to flower after exposure to cold is something that takes a long exposure of cold to cold. In the lab when we study it, we try to optimize it, but even so with Arabidopsis, we're looking at uh, 40 days of cold um, is, is as fast as we can get a response, a full response to occur in certain types. Another response, just as an aside, that requires a long exposure of cold in many temperate uh, plants is the release of buds from bud dormancy. So buds only resume growth in the spring, just like flowering of some of these plants, after there's been not only exposure to cold, but to a long period of cold. And there was a question for Sam about um, plants sensing temperature. Uh, we really don't know anything about how this cold sensing occurs. We know a little bit, and I'll tell you about that now, about different aspects of this vernalization system, but not the cold sensing uh, part of it. So how we've studied it is um, in two ways, uh, but all under the heading of genetics. Uh, one is to look at natural variation in this trait. Fortunately, in Arabidopsis, and as I'll tell you about in Brachypodium, there's great natural variation for whether the plants need exposure to cold. So there are types of Arabidopsis. Both of these plants were grown without any cold exposure. There are some that have no need for cold exposure. They flower rapidly anyway. Others, where like that cabbage plant, are almost completely blocked in flowering unless they've been exposed to cold. So it's a simple matter to cross those that require vernalization, those that don't, and ask what's the uh, the genetic difference in this natural variation. And it turns out that its, it's natural variation is, is at two uh, genes, one called Frigida and the other flowering Locus C. And when there are dominant, which we now know to be active alleles, the wild type alleles 
of these uh, genes present in Arabidopsis, it needs, a, it needs cold exposure to flower. If either of these genes are mutated, then you have a rapid flowering plant. And I wanted to say a few words about how that occurs. First of all, this gene, flowering locus C, is a transcriptional regulator. It's a member of the MADS domain uh, family of genes, a family of genes in plants that's been duplicated and diverged extensively, uh, where various members control many aspects of plant uh, development. But flowering locus C, this MADS domain uh, protein, by itself is sufficient to block flowering. So if we overexpress it in a type that normally flowers rapidly, it completely blocks flowering. So then the question is, what does its partner, Frigida, do? Because you need both of them in the natural setting. And what Frigida simply does is it's a gene dedicated to turning on FLC to high levels such that uh, flowering is blocked. So in the absence of a functional Frigida gene, we can't detect FLC expression, but in its presence, we do. And then what happens during cold, uh, the process of vernalization is essentially one of turning off this repressor of flowering. So if we expose plants to a little bit of cold, nothing happens to FLC expression. But if they're exposed to a long period of cold, like 40 days, then FLC is silenced. And it's not only silenced during the cold, but it remains silenced the next spring throughout the rest of the plant's life cycle. So that is illustrated in these slides, um, just in a cartoon way, that in the fall then, when a plant like Arabidopsis or these other types of crucifers that are, by the way, they're called biennials because they typically flower in the second season of growth or the second year if you're in the northern hemisphere where, it's, where the year changes in January. Uh, so biennial means uh, two years to flower. Uh, they, they have FLC expressed in the meristem, the region of the plant that will flower. That's preventing flowering. But somehow during cold, FLC is turned off. It stays off in the spring. That's competence to flower, at least in this class of plants. And then that whole system gets reset as the plants uh, move past the FLC locus to the next generation. Remember, plants don't segregate out a germline like animals do, so the system needs to be reset where FLC is on again in the next generation. And one of the things we've studied is this process of FLC turning off, and I'll say a few words about that, but first I wanted to just mention the larger context in which FLC acts. I don't have time to go into this in any detail, but there's been tremendous progress in uh, plant biology in understanding what promotes flowering. And in many plants, it's a pathway that begins with exposure to the right length of day or photoperiod. Turning on in leaves a particular uh, gene that encodes a small protein, FT, which used to be called florigen, for those of you who are plant biologists in, in the old plant physiology books, we now know what florigen is, a small protein that moves from leaves uh, to the meristem where it finds a partner and the uh, partner FD together turn on a cascade of genes which causes those cells in the meristem to stop forming leaves and now start forming flowers. So this is just in, in brief the, a pathway to flowering. And what FLC is doing to prevent flowering is binding to the promoters of key promoters of flowering making sure those genes that are necessary for flowering aren't expressed. So it's a repressor, repressing the key activators of flowering. So then in, in the beginning of uh, the growth, uh, or the beginning of the life cycle, but rather, of these types of plants that require cold, there's this block to this pathway that causes flowering. And of course, then what cold is doing is turning off the repressor, letting these positive pathways promote flowering in the spring. And also in the spring, at least for Arabidopsis, days are getting longer, which also stimulates this pathway. So what I want to say a few words about is how cold is turning off FLC, or also just how the whole system is set up. So we've done a lot of genetics, we and other, many other labs. So you can screen for two types of mutants. So we started by studying natural variation, but we also have uh, induced mutants and uh, found mutants, studied them, and asked biochemically what's going on. 
So we can screen for mutants that, for example, lose the vernalization requirement. We can start with these plants that need vernalization and find mutants that don't anymore. And of course, we find two of the genes I've described earlier. If you knock out flowering locust C or frigida, plants don't need vernalization. But we f find a whole a host of other genes. And a summary of that work is there is a specific uh, complex, actually many uh, transcriptional activating complexes that activate FLC, but one of them seems to be specific to FLC. It contains frigida, that one gene for which natural variation uh, occurs with respect to flowering, and many other components which somehow have uh, uh, over evolutionary time come to specifically regulate FLC and turn it on to block flowering. The other type of screen is to look for mutants where vernalization doesn't work anymore. And these would identify genes necessary for that process. And we find genes, for example, like VIN3, which stands for vernalization insensitive 3, shown here as its domain structure. but. I don't want to go into detail on that except to say that it's part of a chromatin modeling complex, which isn't surprising based on certain domains, like something called a plant homeo domain that's present in it. One thing that's interesting, though, is you can see that VIN3 is, uh, has a pattern of expression that, we, that hadn't been seen before. That is, it's cold-induced, but it takes a very long period of cold to turn it on. It only starts to be expressed after several weeks in the cold. And its pattern of turning on in the cold, by the way, this first lane is without cold, and the next three lanes are increasing amounts of cold, 10, 20, or 40 days, and then moving plants back into warm conditions. It's our lab equivalent of fall, winter, and spring. And so this only comes up after quite a bit of winter. And when it comes up, it also correlates with FLC turning off. VIN3 doesn't stay on, though, once you put it back into warm conditions back to spring, it turns off. But FLC stays off, even though VIN3 is no longer present. So one class of mutants, so in, in a VIN3 mutant, by the way, FLC just doesn't turn off in the cold. Nothing happens. There's another class of mutants, though, where we call them loss of memory mutants, where FLC actually turns off in the cold, but then it comes back on again when the plants are placed in the warm. It doesn't stay off in the equivalent of spring. And these define uh, different categories then of genes responsible for this whole system of FLC getting turned off and staying off. But with the time that I have, I simply want to give you a summary of our current model of what's going on, work from my lab, but, but many other labs as well. Oh, one other player in the game before I show you the model is that Originating from within FLC itself, this repressor of flowering, only in the cold are some non-coding RNAs. Uh, so there are two classes of them called cold air and cool air, which are sort of takeoffs on the first um, example of a long non-coding RNA where the biochemistry of what it was doing was clear, called hot air, um, which I won't go into. The, it's from the animal realm. Um, but one particular long non-coding RNA here, uh, cold air, which is expressed in the cold from an element that we had found years ago within the intron of FLC, seems to be a critical part of the uh, system. And in, uh, so now it's known that a chromatin-modifying complex first discovered in animals called the polycomb repression complex two, typically has a non-coding RNA associated with it. And so this specific non-coding RNA somehow is helping to target uh, this repressive complex to itself in the cold. And so again, now just a, an overview model. So in the fall, FLC is in this state where it's active. You've all heard of histone modifications and the histone code. Its histones have various modifications, acetylations, and so forth, that are associated with active chromatin. What happens in the cold is uh, there's a system pr involving, presumably, these long non-coding RNAs that recruits a repressive complex to FLC. And this complex has enzymatic activity to change the spectrum of modifications to histones at the FLC locus. So these activating ones get stripped away, and repressive ones, like methylations of lysine 
uh, 9 and 27 on histone 3 get added. And this creates, this begins to establish a repressed state. And in fact, then in the spring, some of these key components that were necessary to initiate the silencing process, like the non-coding RNA and a protein like VIN3, which, was, which is part of the polycomb complex, are no longer present. And a, a stable loop of repression is established at FLC involving some of the other players that are in, that some of which were identified as these loss of memory mutes. So basically, it's about switching chromatin states is how this system works. And just as a quick aside with respect to so-called epigenetic phenomena in plants, that we're dealing with one that's mitotically stable. Once the state switches, it stays that way until the next generation. But then it's reset, as I mentioned. And this seems to involve a lot of modifications to histones, which I haven't taken you through a lot of the details that we know about. Um, but it does not involve changes to the DNA sequence itself, whereas in plants there are many examples of genes being stably silenced from generation to generation. Typically, transgenes are subject to this fate. And this involves methylation of the DNA. So what I've talked about is this process of vernalization, where it begins with somehow measuring cold, that the plants have been in cold for a long period of time, Certain things are induced, like uh, genes that encode parts of chromatin-repressing complexes, small, uh, long non-coding RNAs, which then lead to this epigenetic switch of a target to turn it off and flowering, and then resetting. And the things here in blue are those things we don't really know that much about yet. How do plants measure this long period of cold, or how does this resetting occur? So we're still uh, working on this. One of the ways, we haven't found mutants in, our, in, one, in the typical types of screens for vernalization in sensitive mutants. For, could be for a variety of reasons, which I could discuss after. But what we're trying to do is find more subtle classes of mutants, perhaps those that shift the timing of how much cold it takes. And that might lead us, we hope, to the cold sensing system. Remember, an output of cold, one of the outputs, is a turning on of this VIN3 gene after a long period of cold in the wild type. So we've been screening for mutants where that time frame is shifted. So in wild type, um, no cold, there's no VIN3 expression. Five days doesn't do ever anything. But we now have mutants where just a short period of cold starts the process and turns on VIN3. So we're now identifying those genes with the hope that maybe we'll get it cold sensing. But I want to shift now to uh, back to Brachypodium. And one of the reasons we're studying systems that repress flowering in Brachypodium, as I said earlier, is to uh, think about increasing biomass. But one of the reasons that we need to start from scratch again in Brachypodium is, is the photoperiod systems are conserved in higher plants, but these other systems that are overlaid on it are not conserved. They're a much more recent product of evolution. And the reason uh, for that is, is because when plants were splitting into different major groups, they actually weren't contending with winter. And so just to remind you of that, here's a uh, slide of what our planet looked like about 255 million years ago, which isn't all that long ago on the frame of the time of the planet's been around, about 4.5 billion years. Now, this is a little farther back that I wanted to go, but it's the uh, uh, nice slide that I found. And because plants were diverging uh, the, into the different groups maybe around 180 million years ago. But you can see the picture. The Earth was a lot warmer. The continents were in different places. There wasn't even, for example, an Atlantic Ocean uh, a mere 200 some million years ago. So it was only after continental drift and climate change that plants evolved these systems to repress flowering. Uh, and so they're, although they're similar in how they operate overall, quite different in different groups of plants. And so far, the things we found in grasses, many labs have found, are entirely different uh, than in Arabidopsis. And so I wanted to end by noting that we're just beginning this project in Brachypodium. And the genomic tools that uh, JGI is developing and that we'll hear from uh, next from Sean Gordon as well have been in, uh, just, we couldn't do this without it. But one point I want to make is there's just incredible natural variation in Brachypodium flowering. And I'll give you just one example. 
And this is the length of cold required to trigger flowering in different isolates, which we call accessions of brachypodium. So here's one typically chosen as a lab strain uh, because it doesn't need fertilization. So it's, if you're not working on flowering, it's the easiest one to grow, where it flowers rapidly regardless of whether it's gotten any cold. These numbers at the bottom are just no cold, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and so forth of cold. Then the plants are moved back to warm and allowed to grow for a while um, to flowering or to some point where we just decided to take the picture. But the point is, there are strains that, need, uh, that don't flower without cold, but two weeks is plenty to saturate that vernalization response. Others, uh, it takes four weeks to saturate. You're not getting vernalization with two. Others that require six weeks, eight weeks, or even longer than 10 weeks. So that's just part of this incredible natural variation that's present in, in Brachypodium. And we're crossing a lot of these different strains and looking at this genetically. And so far, uh, just the, the little bit we've done shows that for much of this variation, it's pretty simple genetically, which uh, might not be surprising uh, given that this is an obligate selfing species. Uh, so I could elaborate on what I mean by that if anyone's interested later. But it does seem to be simple genetically. We also have some very interesting variation for other biomass traits like branching. So um, we also are inducing mutants, uh, just like we did in Arabidopsis. And here's an example of an extreme case. Here's the wild type. Uh, here's a particular mutant where flowering is severely uh, delayed. And having the genome sequence allows us to do bulk, uh, pull bulk segregants out of a segregating population of mutants. And now we've narrowed uh, this interval to just a handful of genes and that hopefully within the next few months we'll know which of those genes, when mutated, uh, causes such a striking effect uh, on blocking flowering. So I want to end there but acknowledge the uh, people who have done the work. And I want to, uh, those on the top uh, were involved in the Arabidopsis work I talked about, but I wanted to um, highlight that, that the educational work, as I mentioned earlier, is done with Scott Woody. And the Brachypodium, which is pretty new for my lab, has been set up by two people uh, who are currently working on it, uh, Tom Ream and, and Daniel Woods. And we've benefited tremendously from the collaboration with uh, John Vogel and, and Sean Gordon, who are, are developing Brachypodium tools. I also want to say we've got support from the National Science Foundation, but most of our Brachypodium work is supported by the DOE. Uh, via the uh, Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, which I'm a part of. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. There are questions? So is, is it always the case that if you, if you prevent flowering, if, if you sexually frustrate the plant, it puts its energy into growth? Is that, is that a yeah, simple-minded way to think of it? Yes, because what, what happens is that when flowering occurs, a meristem, at least in plants like grasses, gets used up. So it's a terminal differentiation event. But if, if you don't have flowering, there's no terminal differentiation. The plant has no choice. It'll just keep growing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't want plants to keep growing forever. Uh, you know, at some point, you want to terminate it. You want the plants to senesce and be ready for harvest if you're using them for biomass. But I think a lot of fine-tuning could occur. And can that senescence happen with, in the absence of flowering? Is that that's an interesting question that we're looking at. That's, uh, that's if we can, when we block flowering, then we can test those hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Is the, is the cool air, you said there was a... Uh, inside story about the name of that mutant. It doesn't reference whole lot of love by Led Zeppelin, does it? No, no, no. It's just that in the animal world, the first one discovered was called hot air. Okay. But hot air doesn't have anything to do with temperature sensing. It's hawks induced. So it's about the hawks cluster in animals. Mm -hmm. But then in the case of the, it was C. Bum Sung uh, who discovered the cold air. And uh, he thought it would be cute to, uh, because then it actually has relevance to Kind of re to kind of pay homage to uh, hot air, uh, but it's really sensing part of this cold sense. It's the output of a cold sensing system. Mm 
That's good because in general, the, the animal gene names are often funnier than the plant gene names. So right. This is, so once this is an opportunity yeah. <laughs> to re remedy that. No, that's Thanks, a, Rick. That's a good point because <laughs> I'm guilty of things like flowering locust C, which have no uh, humor or creativity. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.